I'm going to read A Friend Divided by Ernesto Cisneros, chapter one. Once again, Efren Nava woke up to a chubby pajamaed foot in his face. He squinted at the bright yellow rays peeking in through the win broken window blinds and looked to his left, but it wasn't Mia's foot. She was fast asleep, cuddled at the edge of their mattress with the same naked plush doll whose clothes she'd taken off and lost a long time ago. He looked to his right. Sure enough, the foot belonged to Max. How Max managed to roll over e Efren during the middle of the night was beyond him. Efren shook his head and sighed, but when he caught sight of the tiny hole on the right foot of his little brother's flannel onesie, smiling, Efren licked the tip of his pinky and gave a wet willy to Max's pudgy toe. Efren covered his mouth and stifled his laughter as the sleeping Max pulled away his leg. However, the victory didn't last long. Max spun around in his sleep and planted his other foot in Efren's face. There was no way to win. Efren yawned himself fully awake before turning toward his parent's side of the room. Once again, Appa was gone. No sign of his heavy jacket or scuffed up work boots by the front door either. It seemed no matter how early Efren tried getting up, he just couldn't catch Appa getting ready for work. Amma was the same way and never slept in. Any minute now, she'd wake up, unwrap her blankets, and go right to the kitchen to make breakfast. There was a pot full of leftover frijoles from last night's dinner, and that meant she would be she would for sure be making fresh sopes this morning, Efren's favorite. But before that, Efren had something important to do. He lifted Max's leg by the pajamas and got up, careful not to disturb Mia, who now snuggled close to Max. Efren stepped over the pair of pint-sized leg, pint legs and arms blocking his path. He wasn't sure which was worse, sharing a mattress with two kindergartners or sharing, this, sharing the bathroom. Their apartment was really one big room, so the only place they could find peace and quiet was the bathroom. Efren looked in the mirror, wincing as he removed the tiny strips of tape, pinning his ears back against the sides of his head, an idea he came up with after repeatedly hearing Amma warn the little ones against making funny faces. Sus caras se les van a quedar así, she'd say. Their faces freezing. That's exactly what Efren counted on. It was only a theory, but if it were even slightly true, he get he he guessed the same would apply to his ears. If he could manage to tape back his ears often enough, they too would eventually freeze and finally stop sticking out. All he would all he had to do was make sure they folded in just the right way for a couple more weeks and presto, normal ears that didn't stick out like the knobs on Frankenstein's neck. After taking care of business, Efren climbed inside the empty bathtub with a library copy of There's a Boy in the Girl's Bathroom by one of his favorite authors, Louis Sakar. Efren loved reading books, even when he'd read them before. It was like visiting an old friend. The main character, Bradley Chalkers, was the best. And it wasn't just that he had a, a really sweet side to him that his classmates didn't get to see. Nope, the boy was super tough, and no matter how rough things got for him, he continued to show up and fight, like Efren's best friend David, another misunderstood kid. Some kids at school only saw this white kid who likes to dress flashy and flaunt his latest piece of jewelry, but Efren knew the real David, the same boy who once took off the sweatshirt he was wearing and donated it for a clothing drive in the neighborhood. Normally, Efren would lie in the tub reading and laughing until a stampede of feet came running toward the door, but this morning his eyelids were extra heavy and the need for sleep was too powerful. He couldn't fight it, not after staying up so late waiting, waiting for Amma to return from working overtime hours at the factory. For the last couple of weeks, there had been a whole lot of talk, a whole lot of chisme, especially around the laundromat, about various raids and stop points happening around town. Efren tried not thinking about what he'd seen on the news, all the stories about families being separated, kids put in cages, but that was easier said than done. Efren couldn't help but worry. Despite numerous lectures from Amma and repeated threats of being on the receiving end of her chancla, he stayed up really late until she got home. He'd done the best he could to piece together the information he heard, but it wasn't easy. It seemed like any time he caught adults talking about it, someone in the room would nod toward him and the topic would shift to something else, usually the final minutes of the previous night's telenovela. After an unplanned nap in the tub, Efren heard rattling in the kitchen and headed over. By the stove stood Amma wearing her fuzzy blue robe that according to Max made her look like the cookie monster. Efren stood and admired how easily Amma formed perfect little saucers from the doughy masa de maíz and then pinched the steaming edges to form a tiny wall to keep the beans from seeping off. Her hands were tough and hummingbird fast as she tested the griddle's temperature by touching it with her bare fingers. How did she manage not to burn herself? Efren wondered. 
Amma's sopes were delicious, and even though they weren't much more than a thick corn tortilla topped with beans and fresh ranchero cheese, Efren didn't think of them as a poor man's meal. To him, to Max, to Mia, they were a special treat. Just one of the many milagros Amma performed on a daily basis. Something super. Super sopes. Sopers. That made Amma sup soper woman. Efren laughed to himself. The word fit her perfectly. Before long, Max and Mia were up and climbed onto their usual seats at the table. Sopes! They turned to each other and sprang out into song. Frijoles, frijoles, de las comidas más ricas. Lo más que lo que comes, lo más que pitas. Efren shook his head. You guys should be practicing your English. My fifth grade teacher, Mrs. O'Neill, used to say that's the only way to master the language. Aquí están. Ama set the breakfast spread on the kitchen table, her exhausted eyes creasing as she smiled. Mijo, most of the world speaks more than one language, and Spanish is a part of who we are. She moved toward Efren and ruffled his hair. You'll understand when you're older. Max and Mia reached in first, each picking up a bean and cheese topped sope. Efren eyed the last one while Ama filled the glasses with chill, chilled orange juice. Ama, where is yours? Ay, amor, a cup, of, a cup of cafecito is all I need. Efren's stomach grumbled, but it was his heart giving the orders. Ama, why don't you take mine? I can have breakfast at school anyway. There's no point letting all that school food go to waste. And have them think I can't provide for my own children? No, gracias. Efren inhaled. Ay, ama, he said, knowing that she was simply being well. Ama. She pulled out a nopal she'd cut yesterday from the cactus plant peeking over the neighbor's fence and matter-of-factly scraped off the thorns with a knife. Then she held it over the stovetop barehanded. When it was well roasted, she scooped up the remainder of the beans with a wooden spoon and created a sort of cactus taco. See, I'm fine, she said, taking a bite. Being soper woman wasn't just about checking teeth, flattening down cowlicks, and making sure Max wore only one pair of underwear at a time. It included making sure that everyone wore perfectly creased pants and that any holes made the day before were creatively sewn or patched over. It's one thing to not have a lot of money, Amma reminded them just about every morning. It's another to look the part. Of all the things Amma did, this baffled Efren the most. How could a person who sometimes spent 70 plus hours a week locked in a factory behind a steaming iron go anywhere near one at home? Then again, this probably explained her talent for barehandedly flipping tortillas and carrying them to the table without even a wince. Okay, mijos, time to get ready for school. Everyone knew the drill. Put on the clothes neatly laid out last night by Ama, brush teeth, comb hair, and then grab backpack with lunch inside. Ama was about to hand out well-done kisses when out of nowhere a helicopter hovered and roared uncomfortably close overhead. Ama waved a fist. Ay, this is the second time in three weeks. Unfortunately, sometimes the nighttime activities from our, the neighborhood carried over into the daytime hours. Home raids, car chases, and suspects at large were all as familiar as Palatero, trucks selling ice cream bars out of, out of, outside of church. Ama marched to the front door and locked the metal screen. Going into lockdown mode, Max and Mia shut and locked the sliding glass door in the back of the apartment before Ama could even ask. No one spoke a word, listening for screaming, sirens, or worse, gunfire. Ama peeked through the layered curtains she'd sewn together last spring. It was just passing by. Ama had barely unlocked the door before the twins rushed past her and ran outside. Niños, don't run down the stairs. She turned to Efren, who was busy strapping on his backpack. What am I going to do with those two? Adoption? Ama uh, playfully slapped the back of his head before stepping outside. The twins waited by Don Ricardo's food truck parked curbside. Can we get some chetos? Efren rolled his eyes. Guys, for the last time, they're called Cheetos. Ama smiled and waved off Don Ricardo, or Don Tapatillo, as most of the neighborhood called him because of the huge mustache and sombrero that he wore. No gracias, she said. Tal vez después de la escuela. Don Ricardo smiled, returned the smile and nodded as she steered the twins away by their arms. If you are good, she added. Ama and Efren followed the twins into the kindergarten playground. Even though the school was only a sprint away, Ama never let them go alone, not even Efren, whose middle school was only blocks away. Between the swings and patch of dirt used for playing marbles, Max and Mia bear-hugged their favorite teacher, Miss Solomon. She was an older lady dressed in a gray business suit and chasing clashing white sneakers. Eventually, they let her go and ran off to play on the jungle gym. Ama approached the teacher for a hug herself. Senora Nava, Miss Solomon asked. Como esta? Excelente, maestra, excelente. 
Miss Solomon turned to Efren. And you, senorito, are getting almost too big to hug. Almost. She leaned in and hugged him too. Even when the air, with the air inside him being squeezed out, Efren continued to smile. Miss Solomon paused to examine him once more. I can't believe how big you're getting. Reminds me of how old I'm getting. You're not old, Miss Solomon, Efren answered. You look exactly the same as when you taught me. And of course, that made her laugh. Buenos dias, Ama chimed in. How have my little ones been behaving? Miss Solomon turned and scrunched her lips to one side. Just one tiny problema, she said, following with a short chuckle. Yesterday, Max decided to hide underneath the sink and Mia would not stop crying until we found him. That was typical Max. Unlike Mia, Max was born with his umbilical cord wrapped around his neck. Sadly, all the minutes Max went, went, went without oxygen hurt his brain, made it hard for him to learn, something he would have to deal with all of his life. Ama said it was a milagro that he survived at all. Efren couldn't help but wonder what Max would have been like had the doctors caught the problem in time. Yeah, it's amazing how much Mia worries about him. I think it's super sweet. Suddenly, Miss Solomon's face lit up. Oh, before I forget, I already submitted your name for this year's Christmas gift baskets. I know it's still November, but I wanted to make sure that you were included, especially after all the help you gave me putting together the costumes for last, month, last month's play. Gracias, Maestra, said Ama, but we already got our turn. It's best if somebody else gets it this year. Miss Solomon pressed her lips together. Oh, all right, she said, but I do have a favor to ask. Miss Solomon, after everything that you have done for my children, no favor is too big. Consider it done. Well, she leaned in closer to Ama. I have a date. He's really cute, she said, giddy with excitement. Efren made a face and turned toward the playground. And he's a doctor, she added. I promised to cook dinner for him and was hoping to get the recipe for that fabulous mole you make. Ama turned to Efren. Efren, mijo, you've been asking me for weeks now. How would you feel about walking to school by yourself? Solo, he asked. Solito, she added. Efren's fist pumped the air and shuffled his feet in a celebratory dance. Can I go home and pick up my bike? Only if you take your helmet. He scowled at the thought of showing up to school wearing the turtle-shaped helmet Ama bought him from the swap meet. No thanks, I'll walk instead. With that, Efren darted past the portable classroom by the kindergarten side of, the, of campus and onto Highland Street. He passed Doña Chan Chana's lime-colored duplex and paused to look at her guayaba tree where he scanned the branches. Guayabas were his favorite, but that wasn't the kind of fruit he could picture any of, it, any of his teachers eating. He figured teachers wouldn't accept anything coming from grubby kid hands unless it came with a thick peel. Guayabas were definitely out. That was the thing about Highland Street. Some people just saw the worn apartments and graffiti-tagged walls, but it offered good things too, like the fruit trees as far as the eye could see. According to Ama, it had to do with people her age being used to growing their own fruit. That was one of the beautiful things about walking this street. Even though people on the block didn't have much, everyone still shared and looked out for each other. Efren strolled a bit further, stopping at the apartment complex sandwiched in the middle of the block. Up high in an avocado tree, a litter of black kittens competed for his attention. Hey kitties, you guys might be cute, but I'm allergic to you. Only the kittens didn't pay any mind to what he said and continued looking down at him and purring in their kitty language. No, it's not going to work. I have to get going or I'm going to be late for school. So stop it. I don't care how cute you are. A few minutes later, Efren found himself with red itchy eyes sitting up in the branches with two kitties nestled on his lap. That's when a familiar whistle caught his attention. Efren looked down. Sure enough, it was David on his bike. Even though he was the only white kid living on this block, it wasn't his skin color that made him stand out. It was his hip hop style. Kids on the block called him El Perequito Blanco because of the bright colors and baggy oversized clothes he wore. That and his parrot-like nose. It's been this way since he moved into the neighborhood. It'd been this way. Efren carefully handed, out, handed off the kittens to David and climbed on down. What you doing up there? Asked David, kneading the kittens' backs. I was going to take some avocados to my teachers, but they're still kind of hard. They look like grenades. Have you ever held a real grenade? Efren scratched the top of, tip of his nose. Not a real one. You? No, nope, David pointed to his ears. How about real diamonds, though? Efren leaned in for a closer look. Man, he exclaimed. Sweet earrings. David smiled, showing off his new fake diamond stud earrings, large enough to cover his entire earlobes. Yeah, they're real, too. Efren leaned in closer. Real fake, you mean. David crumpled his forehead. No way, not these. Don Tapatio wouldn't have charged me 10 bucks if they were fake. 
He pointed at his ear. Puro bling bling, he said with a grin. Well, they're way cool. You know what, David surveyed the street. Dude, where's your mom? I know, right? David surveyed the street. Dude, where's your mom? Ephraim shrugged. Oh, I finally complained, told her that I'm too old to be walked to school. David scoffed. Yeah, right, You're prob you, you probably begged her, huh? Yeah, pretty much. Hey, want a ride? Sure. Ephraim jumped onto the handlebars and held on tight. Initially, the bike swayed back and forth, but it eventually straightened as David made it onto the side of the street. You sure you can handle my weight? Ephraim asked. Of course. I gave Concha a ride the other day, and she's not all bony like you. Ephraim laughed. Yep, David continued. She barely squeezed between the handlebars. Ama would have a cow if she'd known they'd been riding together like that. As much as she liked David, she didn't quite understand him. Said she couldn't get why a boy would dye his hair different colors each month, or why he insisted on sagging his pants so low that she always knew the exact pattern of his boxer shorts. Once she even threatened to throw away all of Ephraim's underwear if he ever tried something like that. And even though she was smiling when she said it, Ephraim knew better than to risk it. Today, though, Ephraim felt like a real-life celebrity strutting his stuff down the red carpet. He sat upright, waving at all the elementary school kids still being escorted by their overly protective mothers. That's right, world. Eat your heart out. For once, he knew what it was like to be independent, like David. And all the time Ephraim had known David, he had never seen anyone calling him inside when it got late. Never saw anyone coming out to the playground to see if he needed a sweater or hassle him for not keeping his shirt tucked all the way into his pants. When the duo reached the school, David stopped at the bike rack where the school security guard, Rabbit, was standing. At least that's what kids called him. They thought it was a clever name for the old man who was so slow that a tortoise could outrace him. Ephraim hopped off the bike and untucked his shirt. So what's up with you? You usually get here right before the late bell. Simple. You are looking at this year's, this year's new ASB president. ASB? Associate something. I don't know. Point is, I'm going to run for school president. I know I'm only a seventh grader, but so is Jennifer Huerta, and she's the only other person running. She's such a teacher's pet, there's no way I'm going to lose to her. You do know that's a bunch of extra work, right? I know, but the way I figure once I win, I can pass a new rule for the vice president to have to do all that stuff. Efren crinkled his forehead. Dude, I don't think that's how it works. Of course not. That's why I'm running. To fix it. You know what? You should run for office too. But then I'd have to do all your work. Or you could be treasurer. He slid his fingers over his palm as if peeling a potato. It's going to rain money for sure, and you'll be in charge of it, of it all. Dude, we're talking millions. Efren shook his head. I don't know about that. Besides, I'm not really into politics. Forget politics. We're t I'm talking instant popularity. By next year, we'll both have our pick of girls. So that's what this is, this is about. David went all puppy-eyed, a look Efren had seen plenty of times before. Nah, no thanks. Fine, said David, but will you at least go with me to the candidates' meeting? Efren knew all too well how horribly wrong most of David's plans usually went. Still, he couldn't say no to his best friend. All right, but you owe me. Duh, dude, that's how politics work.